choice of three girls. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk today about the different phases of work that have happened on the site, uh, some of the substantial vegetation clearings that happened before excavation. Uh, the survey work had the three seasons of excavation, two of which are completed. We just finished excavating about four weeks ago um, to this year, and we've got another two weeks planned for next year, 2019. So, the Historic Environment Scotland um, granted permission to work on the site as a scheduled monument, and we were able to excavate seven trenches, four of which have been excavated, and we'll be revisiting some of those next year and opening up a couple of the ones we haven't got to yet. So, uh, just to sort of point out really, this is very much the initial thoughts and findings so far. We're in the midst of um, the excavation and field work itself, and we still have a lot of post excavation work to do. But I'll be able to talk you through what we found so far. So, the project aims were to establish a chronology for the development of the, um, the site itself, understand how that fits in with the wider landscape, assess the impact of the rotted engine growth on the archaeological deposits, is there a need for a uh, sort of mitigation strategy? beyond taking the rods and engines off. Engaging volunteers led by professionals um, to do the excavation, the recording, the survey, and really improving access both to the site itself but also to information about the site. Um, and it's a wider aim that adds into the ongoing research by a number of different people um, on hill forts in Scotland um, and other enclosed sites. So in terms of uh, how that fits in with the sort of SCARF uh, research aims, um, there's lots of different things that fits in with, but the things that I've sort of picked out to talk about a wee bit are um, understanding the role of hill forts, what type of um, space and activity is happening on hill forts, and it's likely that this would have varied across time and space, but we could be looking at um, sort of tribal um, centres, we could be looking at uh, places of kingship um, or gathering spaces, seasonal meeting places, lots of different things could be happening there at different times, and really the best way to find out is to try and excavate them. So there's quite a lot of um, work has been done more recently, but till more recently there'd been a lack of dating evidence for enclosed sites um, and a lack of evidence for activities within. So that's something we're trying to address um, at King's Seat by excavating on the interior, as well as understanding the, the construction of the enclosing features. And another thing that's particularly re relevant to this site is understanding, are we looking at prehistoric sites? and that have been reused perhaps later in the early historic periods, are they purely a prehistoric phenomenon? Um, and the answer is there's a mix of different things going on in different places, so understanding more about the King's Seat site near Dunkeld um, will help feed into those sorts of questions. So we have lots of different sorts of people involved in the project, we have adult volunteers every day, a number of different um, people on site from Perth and King Ross Hershey Trust for the AMC, we had local school groups coming, primary schools came for the day to learn how to dig and excavate. The young archaeology club that you saw earlier were up for the day. Um, and we also had a number of work placements from both secondary school pupils and also from uh, UHI students who were studying archaeology. So to give you a bit of background about the site, you've got Dunkeld here, Burnham here, and then over to the west, the site of King's Seat which is overlooking this bend in the River Tay and also overlooking this narrow pass which leads to the north and to the south uh, which on some maps is marked as the King's Pass. So quite a strategic location both in terms of uh, where it can be seen from and what it, you can see from it. To put that in a bit of a wider context, this is the site of King's Sea up here in red with this north-south uh, Tay Valley here and leading down into the sort of much more open area of Strathairn down here. And each of these yellow dots represents a fort or a closed site, um, a number of which have been excavated relatively recently. You've got the SURF uh, project, University of Glasgow's investigated some of the sites here, Tay Landscape Partnership, looking at Moncrief, Morden, Castle Law, and Renethi. And um, just also to point out the location of Dundurn, because I'll be talking about that in a moment. So this is the site of King's Seat. Just on top of this very heavily wooded knoll here, this is the King's Pass, this narrow pass running through, and then the River Tay, and you can see just how um, sort of prominent and strategic that position is um, of the site that we're looking at then. <coughs> to give you a sense of the layout of the site, I'm using one of the Royal Commission plans from the 1990s, and the main components to note are this area at the very top, quite a small enclosed area, as the upper citadel on some records, a series of banks, terraces running around the western side, enclosing a relatively flat middle terrace, 
very, very steep and vertical cliff face here, and at the very base of that hill that the site's on, another eastern moor enclosure of a fairly different nature. Uh, King Seat's mentioned on a number of different early maps, and it's also mentioned in the uh, accounts from the 1800s um, as potentially being a fort of the Caledonians or a site near that, near Dunkeld. It's also um, something that crops up in Alcock's book on hill forts, and he's basically sort of pointing out a number of different sites that he describes as being of sort of pre Roman situation and appearance, so prehistoric sites. But interestingly, everyone who's picked out on this map, including Casey, pictured here, um, has had some sort of early historic activity on it, um, either construction and structures on the site, or perhaps later early historic reuse. So we were sort of bearing that in mind when approaching uh, the excavation and work at King's Seat. This is a picture of the site, just to try and give you a sense of how overgrown and wooded it is. You can see the really dense rhododendron on the top that's all being cleared off now. And this kind of managed, not very well managed, woodland around the uh, base of the hill, but very steep, very craggy. And the reason I'm sort of pointing that out is because you can see that in a number of other sites, um, such as Dundurn and Denat, where you've got this quite similar topography, landscape location, and morphology of the actual site that the hill fort is situated on. Um, these kind of craggy outcrops with quite small areas at the top that are enclosed. One of the other things that's worth noting is it's got these multiple terraces, the, the lower um, eastern terrace, the mid-western terrace, and this very small area at the top. Um, and so that's been sort of theorised to be related to some sort of social hierarchy, different activities happening in different places on some sites. So as we're starting to excavate the site and understand what's going on there, these are the sorts of things we were thinking about. So this is um, part of the team that did the rhododendron clearance. It was weeks and weeks of work, um, a huge amount of work done, uh, just to get this area at the top clear. And before this was done, it was basically physically inaccessible. It was almost impossible to sort of make your way through. Um, so a huge amount of work done there that just prepared the way for the survey work and excavations. So this plan just outlines this, the same features as the Royal Commission plan and marks out where we had our trenches. So we permission for seven, and we had two, Trench uh, 3 and Trench 5 looking at the upper citadel wall, Trench 2 and 4 looking at the interior of the upper citadel, Trench 6 testing its middle terrace, Trench 1 trying to understand the construction and phasing of the banks and ramparts and terraces on this side, and Trench 7 again testing the construction for comparison uh, on the east. So we've excavated all of the trenches except six. We're coming back to four and we still have to do seven. So I won't talk too much about six and seven on that basis as we've not really made much progress there. So that's something for September 2019. So this is a photograph from the top of trench one, that big long trench that runs down the western ramparts and terraces. And we tested all the different banks and ramparts to understand their construction and try and um, get a sense of whether these are all things built as one system or if we've got multiple different banks being reworked and added to and the site being added to over time. Uh, and it, what we'd like to do is be able to understand um, a much more detailed chronology for that um, over time. So this upper bank was composed of earth and rubble, these big stones, and it had a timber structure at the back. And that was evidenced by two very large postholes on the back side of this rampart. Um, and these were visible underneath the slumped material of the bank. It's on a very steep slope, so a lot of these um, defensive features, banks that have run around the edge of the hill have actually a lot of slumped quite far from um, their original sort of shape. The middle terrace is quite similar, again composed of earth and rubble with a bit of um, a sort of a mix of um, soil and possibly degraded turf. Um, and this one didn't seem to have an obvious timber component, but it's possible that the, the evidence that's just been lost with the amount of erosion that's happened. Um, but this one interestingly had evidence of what's possible from a uh, stone face. So once we've removed some of this slumped boulder and earth material, um, there's this spread of stone, which is possibly the front face of the wall that slumped forward, and then the banks kind of eroded off over the top of that, covering it. So it was only really evident towards the end of the excavation. So we hope to maybe come back and just take another close look at this and understand a bit more about it. 
The terrace um, below that was always noted as being possibly augmented or changed or affected in some way by later Victorian landscaping on the site. Um, and indeed, once excavated, it became clear it was basically just this big line of quite substantial boulders, not much more to it than that, and they're just placed more or less directly onto the bedrock. So it's possible that this is actually related more to a current trackway which leads into the site um, and it's maybe a later addition to the site rather than anything of any particular antiquity. So we did the same thing at the top and the upper citadel wall um, to understand is it the same, is it different, why is it different? Um, the feature here at the top, very hard to see, a lot of it seems to have eroded either completely off the edge of the steep cliffs um, or it's slumped forward and so it's a much lower feature on the ground uh, to look at today. Um, but we were able to identify a possible inner face or curb just running along here, um, but no evidence of anything on the front face, just basically it's beyond the fence, it's more or less a vertical drop. So whatever's there is either inaccessible or already fallen off the edge. So um, no timber component noted here, but again the preservation might mean that, that if there's any sort of palisade or timber component running along the top that we've maybe lost that geothermal reaction on the site. So to give you a sense of the character of the upper citadel, um, you can see here it's not a nice flat surface with space for lots of buildings. It's quite sloping and undulating. You've got these steep slopes with bedrock not far below the surface and then small areas where in theory you have enough space to put up a couple of structures. And it's also dominated by this massive glacial erratic which is composed of a schist which has been brought in by glaciation and dumped on the site, which is quite a dominant feature on the top. So this is another view from below. This is the glacial erratic here, and it has four holes just on the top, which appear to be bored into it at some point. They're not modern geological cores, they've not been drilled in, um, but at what date and what those relate to is quite hard to say at this stage. Some sort of structure on top of the stone, perhaps. And then you can see beyond it, one of our trenches exposing part of the interior, just showing how close to the surface some of the bedrock is here. And this is another view looking down towards the stone. And you can see this bedrock, very thin layer of um, deposits on top, probably just a couple hundred years of forest loam built up there. So that could imply that actually at the time of use of the site in the past, the bedrock's been exposed. And certainly some of the weathering on the bedrock looks that way. Uh, we have evidence for quarrying, possibly quarrying for material to make up the banks and ramparts on the site using the local stone. Um, and also in places, possible settings, just a couple, and they don't make a great um, pattern or anything that would relate to a particular structure, but a couple of things dug into the bedrock, perhaps post settings or something like that. So, um, sort of hints of activity. And overlying this bedrock, we have this layer of what we've described at times as hill wash. It's a topsoil, it's very undifferentiated, and the reason for that, we think, is because a lot of the material, wherever it's come from on the site, has been eroding off the hill and it's been mixed by this really, really heavy impact that the rods and engines have had on the site. And the mixing was really evident from the types of finds we've got out of this layer. Um, so quite unusually for Hillport, we had lots of material culture. Um, and so we had things like uh, crucible fragments, which could be of early historic date, uh, right next to a modern Tempe piece, right next to early prehistoric lithic, all kind of in the same layer um, that's very hard to tell with um, the individual sort of geography of. So a fairly sort of clear sign that there's been a fair amount of impact to the site in terms of the, the archaeological layers being disturbed by reaction and erosion. So this year we were lucky enough to find something that was a little bit more structural, um, so I'll talk through the, the basics of that. The, just to put um, you in mind where you are on the site, the, the glacial rat is just off of shot here, and the trench that showed all the bedrock that was in the last slide is just up here, it's been backfilled at this point. So just down this nice little flat terrace, we know, um, identified a very rough but revetted stone platform and it's built up against this natural bedrock vertical face here. So some sort of base for a, either an open air platform or possibly the base of a small structure but um, no coastals or anything evident for a structure on top. What was clear though was that we had some in situ burning. Uh, this orange tinge to the soil showed that there had been some sort of burning activity happening in this area, really rich in charcoal, and we've done quite a detailed sampling strategy here to try and understand what that burning might relate to, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get a sense of when this was happening. 
The reason we're particularly interested in this is because of the number of finds that have been found just down the slope from this. Uh, lots of evidence of metal working, which I'll go into a bit more detail in a minute, um, but perhaps implying um, that we might have an air burning related to metal working here. So that's something I'd like to prove if we can see any evidence of slag or hammer scale or anything like that in our samples once they're processed. That'd be great. So just down the slope from that, another structure here, a uh, stone current hearth. And this was a much more definitive setting for burning. And we have multiple layers in the hearth um, showing that it's been used multiple times. It's packed full of animal bone, quite well preserved. Um, and we also have a spread of ash and animal bone around the edges of the hearth as well. Um, and so what we were sort of hoping to do this year was just understand, is there something structural happening here? Or are all these finds just related to general activity on the site? So I think we can say there's been some sort of structure here. And in 2019, when we come back to this area, we're going to be down onto an area. Um, you can see it just in this slide, this kind of yellow tinged soil here. This deposit is quite a hard packed possible ground surface or floor surface, for lack of a better word. Um, and so we're hoping to understand by cleaning that off and getting down to the more in situ layers that are less disturbed. Do we have any post settings that are currently obscured? Um, can we identify anything to do with a structure that is hard we have sat within? Um, we might also be looking at a site that's had a sort of primarily turf um, component to the walls, and that could also explain the quite deep um, topsoil or undifferentiated hill wash deposits that we have at the base of the bedrock face here. Um, so we could be looking at a structure that's made primarily of turf walls and that's all eroded and being mixed by root action to the point where we can't identify some structure. So that's the kind of main plan for next year to come back to this area. So what I'd like to do now is talk through some of the initial thoughts on all the material culture on the site. As I said, the law of Code 42 excavate, you find very little in terms of uh, material culture, but this has been quite different in that respect. And these are the kind of early findings of my colleague, uh, Dr. Don McLaren, who's been sort of kind enough to take a very quick look at stuff just after it came off site. So everything I say now is going to be very initial, and we'll hopefully have a lot more to say as we start to actually look at it in a lot more detail and start to do different analyses and post excavation um, program gets properly underway. So quite a few spindle worlds from the site, and uh, one of the several tools that's used in textile production and um, spinning. And we have sort of a couple of this more standard stone discs, and we also have a nice ceramic one with this decoration. So showing that there's some sort of textile production or process of spinning happening on the site. A lot of evidence for um, iron working on the site. There's a lot of slag, and although it's not been analysed in great detail yet, we're able to say that the iron working is definitely happening on the site. Uh, whether it relates to smithing or smelting or both of those processes is not yet confirmed, but we should be able to say that once we've taken a closer look. Um, a lot of the iron objects are very corroded, so we'll have to do an x-ray on a lot of these objects to understand what their original form and shape would have been. Um, but some of the more uh, obvious ones I'm going to point out today. So we have five or six knife blades, a bit like the one at the top right here. Uh, eight or nine wet stones, which is quite a notable number of wet stones, different materials. This particular one here is the schist, similar to the material that the glacial erratics composed of. Um, so really highlighting that there's probably some sort of metal working going on on site and we've got a lot of wet stones for sharpening blades and processing the blades. And also an angle back knife here, which is quite characteristic of the early historic period. Some spoilers. <laughs> um, and we've also got some other iron objects. Um, this top one on the left here is an iron spoon bit for drilling holes in wood. Um, one half of a set of shear arms, which could have been used as snips for cutting hair or textile, maybe even something like sheet metal or cut animal hides. And a socketed tool, the socket, I don't know if you can make it out on the slide, but just here there's a kind of hollow where there's a socket, and that would have either been some sort of socketed tool or perhaps even a metal arrowhead. And there's about another eight or nine of these sort of iron corroded objects which we can't identify clearly at this stage, but hopefully again, as I say with X-ray, we'll get a lot more detail on these and the ones that we're not, not sure what they are. We've also got evidence as well as for iron working, for other metal working, for precious metal working, and that comes in the form of a number of different crucible um, fragments. Crucibles are the small ceramic vessels used for melting down precious metals, things like copper, silver, 
And um, we have a number of different types of crucible represented with the shards that we've been able to identify, showing that there's different types of precious metal working going on on the site. So we've got quite large fragments from large bag-shaped crucibles, which might be related to um, bronze and copper working. And we've also um, got a couple of smaller fragments, this one in the middle here, potentially related to silver working. But what we don't, we don't know what metals are being worked for sure yet, and what we'll have to do is um, a process called XRF analysis, which will hopefully give us a sense for these little metal vitrified residues on some of the fragments, what the elemental composition of the metals were, and we'll be able to say with more certainty whether we have bronze, copper, silver, or different metals being represented in this process. Um, so we've got lots of different types of things going on. We've also got the reuse of shirts, possibly a, a relined crucible here. You can see that different um, break, uh, or uh, sorry, not break, but like a little fissure there where the crucibles would be relined to repair and reuse. Um, an example of a spout here. And also this stone, it's a windstone uh, material, but it's had this cavity hollowed out into it, and it's possibly a crucible stem, so something you would have popped your crucible in because they have a rounded or pointed bottom, they wouldn't sit well um, on the ground, so you'd have to have a stand for it. And there's a similar example to this sort of crucible stand with vit vitrified uh, metalworking residue uh, known from Denat, which is the seat of the kings of Dalyada over on the west coast. So to kind of add to that understanding of this metalworking happening on the site, um, we've also got a variety of different moulds um, created in stone. And Three different fragments here, this one, and then two fragments that were able to refit. These fragments came out the same day, but they were from diff completely different parts of the site, so showing that there's um, a level of activity and disturbance on the site if these things have been broken up and then chucked in different directions or deposited in different places. And they form what could be sort of loosely described as a mirror shaped mould. Um, and you see other examples of this cropping up in the, the archaeological record. There's one from Port Hawk, from Tarbot Ness, uh, a Botalic estate example, one from the Arlshof, and also further field in Nendrum and Geraint in Ireland. So what's interesting though is that these moulds, although we have examples of moulds, we've never been aware of any examples of the objects being that shape. So it's possible that what's happening is after the precious metal is poured into this and it's solidified and cast, that, that object might have been taken out and sort of sniffed into another shape of object. Um, and Martin Carver, in his Port Hawk publication, has suggested possibly an oil or a mould or something similar to that. So this is something that really merits uh, um, looking again at the distribution of these, um, in particularly in light of the fact we have two similar examples from the same site. And interestingly, this mould here also has um, knife sharpening marks, and if you turn it over, it's also been used as a saddle burn. So evidence of reuse of objects happening as well. We also have quite a few of, um, examples of Ada molds. Uh, they're all very cleaned out, so I doubt we'll ever be able to say what metals will be cast in these. Uh, SRF probably won't work on them, but it's worth considering. Um, to various different states of um, construction, these two at the top here are broken, and this one down the bottom here not actually finished. So this is for just casting the raw material, either for um, ingots to take and melt down at a later stage, or perhaps to be traded for other things. And on top of the, the stone molds, we have a lot of um, fragments of clay molds, so much less easy to preserve. A lot of fragments are very, very rolled and completely undiagnostic, but the clay is very similar to definitely more diagnostic clay mold examples we have from the site. So we're happy to say that they're related to clay molds, but we couldn't tell you what objects are being cast. Um, and that's because these things get broken apart when the object's been created and the, the fragments get discarded. Um, and we have a couple of examples of pin shafts, so we know they're creating pins on the site, um, but we don't know what type because the heads aren't preserved. Um, we have an example of a keying mark where the mould would have fit together with this counterpart here. And a possible brooch or ring-shaped object mould here, and this has got some parallels with Denad, uh, Molten Mark, and Port Hollow as well. Um, so some really nice tantalising glimpses of the objects that are being produced on this site. Sure. We've also got um, a nice selection of uh, ceramics from the site, 10 fragments, uh, representing three to four different e-ware vessels. And e-ware is a, a pottery that's been um, identified at sites like Denant, um, other high status sites, and we're um, able to say that we have at least one example of the bowl, Form that's um, been identified at Denad, and that's 6th to 7th century pottery 
and the ball form itself was particularly only found on high status sites. And some evidence of food residues just up here as well. And eware is a continental import, it's coming across from France, and this is the current distribution. Um, but you can see that the king seat dot, which I've added in to Ewan's map here, is showing that the distribution is moving substantially north and east uh, from where, where it's been previously. So we've really got to be able to push those um, trade maps slightly further north and east than we've been able to before. And this goes hand in hand with a number of um, Anglo Saxon style beads from the 6th, 7th century AD also. And these are produced in uh, glass, they're produced by winding strips of molten glass around little iron wire. And um, on some of the beads, certainly, you can already see that the, there's traces of that iron wire surviving. Um, and a couple of quite rare examples this green bead, you don't get many in Scotland like this, um, but you've already noted that it's similar to a very bright turquoise um, sort of example. Uh, one fragment of vessel glass related to a chemist and conical bone glass beaker, which is 6th century Anglo Saxon, and some uh, glass gaming pieces, which go hand in hand with some stone possible gaming pieces that we find. The glass for the gaming pieces appears to be uh, originally Roman, so again, feeding back into what Fraser's saying about uh, things being recycled. They were probably recycling this glass as well. Um, so, a sense of a site that's high status enough to have bowls and food and potentially um, sort of feasting activities going on and gaming activities, so not a, a society that's on the brink of collapse. So in terms of our conclusions from the site so far, um, we've got these comparisons with Denant and Dern and other sort of high status kingly sites um, in terms of the site morphology and its location. Um, the initial excavations provided us with a good um, basis for understanding the chronology and phasing. We hope with greater carbon dating to be able to say if we have a late prehistoric site that's been reused in the early historic period or a site that's been um, constructed multiple, over multiple um, periods. We have evidence for ferrous and non ferrous and ferrous with metal working across the whole site um, and it's really highlighting that there's been a production of prestige metal work here feeding in with trade routes um, presumably across Scotland and further afield and the, the types of assemblages so far that we've been able to kind of identify is, is sort of quite comparable with things from Old Mark, Denad, Dundurn, Buston Crown, among, among other sites as well. And looking at this network in conjunction with the e-ware, with the, the glass beads, and um, the other sort of finds on the site, we're looking at quite a high status site used in the 6th, 7th century AD, if not before and after as well. Um, and we've got a lot more work to do as well in terms of two more weeks of excavation next September. We've got to do animal bone analysis to understand the different species represented. Is there any evidence of butchery? Could we relate that to feasting? Or is the animal stuff being processed for other reasons as well? Um, in terms of the finds analysis, we need to conserve X-ray, XRF and SEM analysis for different uh, types of finds. And as I say, we have a programme of radiocarbon dating to get underway, underway to understand how the finds on the site, the activity on the interior is actually relating to the structures and the, the construction. Um, and that will all be followed by a year of further synthesis and publication um, by the project team. So it just remains really to thank everyone who's been involved. Um, this is all the different people who've had a, a sort of part to play in the project. Um, and in particular thanks to Don McLaren who, as I said, looked at stuff with a very short turnaround time between finishing digging um, and starting to present the, the results. And the funders have just marked the top of the news. Thank you for that speaking.